Okay, so um, just as a reminder from last time, uh, this is what tidy data is, right? Your variables and columns, observations in rows, and then your values are at the intersection or in you know, what fills in those two things. So we covered um, pivot longer and pivot wider last time. So today we're going over separating and uniting. Um, we'll just cover so, sort of briefly a few parameters for these two functions. Uh, there's a small section on missing values, which is actually very important. And then we have a real world exercise and it's the WHO data set of uh, tuberculosis cases worldwide. So hopefully we uh, make it through all of that today and I'll try and keep to that. So separating and uniting. Um, so from last time, what happened to table three, right? We went through every single other table, but not table three. So table three, has a different problem, right? So we were looking at countries uh, by the years and then tuberculosis cases and rate. So table three has the cases and population in one column, right? So in order to fix this, we need the separate function and separate will essentially just pull apart this column into multiple columns and it will look by a non-alphanumeric separator wherever it appears and just do that. So let's see. Um, separate rate into cases and population, right? So it's done that. Um, you can also give separate a specific character. So you can pass the, for example, the, I think that's a backslash or forward slash, and it will also take into account. Um, okay, but the thing is that uh, separate will leave the column type as is, right? So you have cases as character and population as character. So that's not very useful. So in order to convert it to the correct type, then you can add convert true and it will do that for you. And so now cases is int and population is int, right? Um, in addition, you can also pass a vector of integers to the step argument, right? And this will interpret the integers as positions to split at. So separate again, year into century year, Sorry, this is a different column. Um, and SEP2 means that it's starting, because it's a positive uh, values, you're starting on the left-hand side and then moving however many places are specified. Negative values would start on the right-hand side and move in the other direction. <clears throat> there was um, a comment here that says, you know, when using integers to separate strings, the length of SEP should be one less than the number of names in INTO but I wasn't super sure what that means because into here has two values and then separate is also two. So that's not one less. So John, do you know what, what that might have been referring to? Uh, the length of SEP is one in that you only gave one value. You could tell mm -hmm. it multiple mm -hmm. places, multiple positions to separate at. Got it, got it, yeah. okay. So that makes it, thank you so much. Okay, so if there's a separate, there is a unite. So let's rejoin the center, century and year columns, right? So the call is table five and then unite uh, into new century and year. So it did it, but now this looks very strange, right? Um, so the default will place an underscore between the values from the different columns. And again, you wanna use the set argument to fix that. So we don't want a separator in this case, so just use quotes and then nothing in between to tell it to do that. So now it looks good. Um, okay, so let's go on to the exercises. So what do the extra and fill arguments do and separate? <coughs> so let's see, we have two tables. Um, this one has columns one, two, three, and then all of these letters. And then Similarly, okay, so what's the deal here? So the first table actually has, should have had D, E, F, G in, in the second row, right? Um, so this G is extra. And then for this table, this D, E column is too short. And so when you run as is, um, you're, you're gonna get a warning, right? Um, so expected three pieces, some are missing or some, or, or there's too many. So what do we wanna do in that case? Um, 
So this extra argument will tell separate what to do if there are too many pieces, right? The fill argument tells it what to do if there aren't enough pieces. Um, so by default, separate will drop any extra values with a warning. But if you add this um, argument, extra equals drop, then you'll get the same result, but without the warning. So I guess that's nice. And the G is not there, okay? So- Just a, a note. You have a typo that you said it will drop the D and obviously it actually drops the, the G, the last one. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay, so extra is set to merge, extra equals merge, then the extra values are not split and FG is gonna appear there. So there you go. Um, now in this following example, one of the values, just scroll through. DE has too few elements, right? So the default for fill is similar to those in separate. It will fill columns with missing values, but it will tell you a warning. Um, there's a warning. That's the one with too few elements, right? Um, okay, so then uh, there are also alternative options for fill, which are uh, left or fill right. So essentially what this does is um, it's putting an NA here and then just sort of smushing, not smushing, but moving the DE over, right? <clears throat> so that's fill left. And then the same idea for fill right, except that you're starting from the other side. So here's the NA and the DE are placed this way. Um, Okay, hopefully that's making sense. So let's go on to this exercise. So both unite and separate have a remove argument. So what does this argument do and why do you want to set it to false? So essentially, um, if you set remove to false, then you keep the original uh, input um, data frame so that you can actually see it in the results. Otherwise, like this X, you know, frame would be gone, um, resulting one. And <clears throat> you set remove equal to false if you wanna keep them. And I actually found this very helpful in just seeing what these things actually do. Cause you have your input right there. <clears throat> okay, so next exercise is uh, compare, separate and extract. We already saw separate. So extract uses a regular expression. Uh, how do you pronounce that? Re regex, regex? I always used to say regex, uh, okay. but my, my spouse uses regex all the time, regex. and she says okay. regex, and so okay. I give her the uh, the credit that it must be okay. regex. <laughs> Sounds good. So a regex to, ex to specify groups in a character vector and then split that single character vector into multiple columns, right? So this is a bit more flexible than separate, right? Because it doesn't require a common separator for specific column positions. So let's see what's happening here. And I'm keeping remove equals false so that we can see the original data frame. And so what it's doing is it's extracting um, from X, the data frame, these two things, variable and ID using this regular expression. So in the first position before the underscore, it's taking uh, not alphanumeric, just alphabetical, uh, I guess, values or character values, so non-numerical values. And then <clears throat> after the underscore, it's uh, all of the numerical values, right? So it took this one, this one. Um, my question here was, because the example has two A's, I, I'm assuming it takes the first day and not the second day. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Actually, it is the second A. Yes, so, I, I, I tested that, yeah. Yeah. That was not intuitive, but... And do you know why it does that? So the regex yeah. you're giving it is a capital letter and then an underscore and then a digit. And Got it, yeah. So it, there's no space, yeah. there's no extra letters in between. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay, that, that's good to know. Great, thank you. Um, okay, and so then here's an example that separate could not parse, but you can actually do it with extract, right? Because um, here there's no separator, um, unless I guess you could potentially, no. Um, so separate I think is just with a separator and there is no separator here. Um, right. Okay. 
Yeah, I think we go over regex uh, quite a bit more in the strings chapter. Um, mm -hmm. Regex is one of those things that, uh, like, it'll <laughs> keep coming up. Like you, I I have never really mastered regex, and I've used it quite a bit. And you know, everyone's at all kinds of different levels on regex, and it's mm -hmm. something that um, the internet is good at helping you with. So <laughs> that's that comes up a lot. But right. it is, it's important. It's useful in so many cases like this, where, you know, the example here is you've got letters and numbers kind of mixed, you know, some number of letters and then some number of numbers. And it's not an yes. easy separator, but the regex can handle it really uh, quickly and smoothly. So. This is really interesting. Okay. So the reason why it's picking up both A's in this case is because you're giving it a plus here, right? Yes. Oh, and it's telling it any like non numerical value yeah. in this case. And, well, actually, it's specifically capital letters is what the capital A Capital letters. So, oh, okay. And then the plus means one or more. So find one or, one or more capital letters and then find one or more digits. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay, so where. Why are there three variations of separation, right? So by position, separator, and then also with these groups, but there's only one unite. And so the reason is that with extract and separate, um, you can only choose one column, right? But you can split it in different ways into several columns. But with unite, there are many choices of which columns to include, but really only one way to combine everything into a single vector. Um, Okay, so let's go on to missing values, right? So changing the representation of a data set brings up an important subtlety of missing values. So values can be missing in one of two ways, right? So either explicitly, and you'll see an NA, or implicitly, meaning there's, they're just not in the data, right? So let's look at this example. So this is an explicit um, missing value. So for the year 2015, the fourth quarter, right? There was uh, no NA for the return. Um, but what else is missing, right? From this data set, um, if you look at it closely. Um, does anyone want to answer that? Becky answered, but she didn't say it out loud and you couldn't see her. <laughs> I see. Okay, yeah, it's um, the one in the 2016. Or Correct. One in yeah. 2016. Yes, one, two, three, four, and then it goes two, three, four for 2016, right? So <clears throat> I thought this was <laughs> really cute and confusing, but one way to think about the difference, right, is with this <laughs> Z like Cohen, which is. An explicit missing value is the presence of an absence, and an implicit missing value is the absence of a presence. Yes. So um, the way that a data set is represented can make implicit values explicit, right? So we can make the explicit missing value by putting years in the column, right? Um, so let's see, one, two, three, four. That's just stock, sorry, that's the original one. And if we pivot wider here, right? Now you see that there's an NA for the first quarter of 2016, okay? So um, additionally, right? Because these explicit missing values may not be important in other representations of the data, you can set values to drop NA. True, right? And now, the explicit missing values will be implicit. So here we go. Let's see what happened here. So the 2016 fourth quarter NA is no longer there. Okay, so that's good. <clears throat> um, okay, another important tool for making missing values, let me scroll up, explicit in tiny data is this complete function, right? And this will come up in our real world example later. So Complete essentially takes a set of columns, right? And finds all unique combinations. And then it ensures that the original data set will contain all, right? So now there it is, 2016 first quarter and NNA is put in there. So um, 
One other thing, so sometimes when a data source has primarily been used for data entry, missing values indicate that the previous value should be carried forward, right? And I'm sure that we're all familiar with this kind of thing, right? So these are NAs, but you can just then um, fill these NAs with fill, right? And that will take a set of columns where you want NAs replaced, in this case, the person, and it's gonna fill them in using the most recent non-missing value. So that's what we want. Um, <clears throat> okay, so exercise, um, what does the direction argument to fill do? So with fill, um, the direction just determines whether NA value should be replaced with the previous or, you know, or the next value. So let's just look at this. Um, so here you have fourth quarter 2015, there's an NA. And if you fill down, it'll fill this in with a point 0.35. Okay, so does anyone have any questions so far? I think we're doing good on time. So let's go on to our case study, which I was very excited to, to work on. So to finish off this chapter, we're actually looking at a realistic data tidying problem using what we've learned. And uh, just a little bit of information, um, this tidy or who data set contains tuberculosis cases. And it's broken down by year, country, age, gender, and the diagnosis method for tuberculosis. The data comes from this World Health Organization site, right? And let's just take a look at it. So there are tons of, uh, you know, epi epidemiological information in this data set, right? But um, as you can see, it's challenging to work with in this, in the form that it is, right? And <clears throat> So this is a very typical real life example data set. So it contains a lot of redundant columns like this country and then ISO one and ISO, ISO two, ISO three, right? Um, then some very odd variable names like new SPM, whatever these things are, right? And lots of missing values, right? So, and it's obviously a messy data set. So in order to tackle this, we just keep in mind that we wanna accomplish one goal at a time, right? <clears throat> we want to run pivot longer or pivot wider, right? And then examine the resulting data and then go back and set more arguments as needed until the data looks like we want it to look, right? So, all righty, let me... The best place to start is let's look at these variable names, right? So names who... So yeah, what is all of this, right? So there's a country, this ISO 2, ISO 3, year is also a variable, right? And all of these other weird looking columns, right? Um, so the first three letters of these variables, right? Denote whether the column contains a new or old case. And if you look through all of the columns, they're all new. Right. So essentially that new doesn't need to be there. It doesn't need to be captured as a separate variable. And then um, the remaining uh, letters and numbers and code, um, essentially what is the diagnosis type, gender, and then age. So we have this data dictionary that will tell us that. And just to go over it, because I think it's good to you know, be familiar with what a data set contains. REL is just the cases of relapse. EP is extrapulmonary TB. SN is um, pulmonary TB that could not be diagnosed by a pulmonary smear. So smear negative, and then the opposite smear positive, right? Then um, the sex, obviously male or female, that's how it's categorized. And then these remaining numbers are actually age groups. And you have seven age groups. So zero through 14, 15 through 24. So that makes sense, yeah. Um, okay, so the first thing that was suggested that we do is let's gather all of these new rel, new variables into a column. And we're gonna call that column key, right? So we're pivoting longer, the columns are, uh, the set of all columns, the names are going into key and the values go to cases, right? And we're also dropping the NAs. Okay, so it's nice to have that all there. Um, 
Then the other thing is we need to fix the inconsistencies in the formatting of the column names, right? So some start with new, as we saw, and then some had new underscore. Um, so what we'll do is essentially replace new with new, just this new rel with new underscore. And we'll learn about replace in the later chapter on strings. Um, so now that should be consistent in the naming. And then we're gonna use separate twice, right? We wanna first separate to split at the underscores in this key column. And so we wanna separate key into new type sex age columns, right? And separate by the underscore. Okay, new type sex age, that's good. Um, we also, at this point, want to clean this up a little bit, right? So essentially just drop this new column because it's all new. Um, and you can actually count to make sure that that is the case. Uh, that should be the number of rows in the full data set, that's correct. And then uh, you just drop it with select, by select, by not, in a sense, by not selecting, not selecting that column, okay. So now is our second instance of separate, and we want to separate the column sex age into sex and age, and we want to split after the first character, right? So separate sex age, separate one. Yeah, that is correct. So now we have the columns that we want or variables. So type, sex, and age. And now we have the cases and no NAs, which is great. So um, even though we did that in several steps, you can also do this all together. And um, the, this actual markdown file had a different way of going through this where they also recoded the ages into something more legible. So I've just put it there, but let's just continue as is. So that's exactly the same thing. It's just showing here that you can just string all of these things together. Okay, so now this looks much better, right? So now we can filter, for example, for a particular type of tuberculosis, right, for a given country, and then sum over the number of cases to see how case numbers for this type of TB have changed over the years, right? So now we do who tidy, uh, we'll, we'll, we're, we are filtering by type SP, so uh, smear positive, the country is in the US, and then we're grouping by year. So the years, and then uh, summarizing um, just by total cases for the year. And then the call to ggplot, the aesthetics are year on the x-axis, uh, cases on the y-axis is total cases for the year. And then we're using a geom point and geom smooth. And that's our very nice graph of how that actually decreased over those years. Um, okay, does anyone have questions on that exercise, because now we're getting into a little bit more detail on that. Okay. I just, I love that they include um, a messy data set in the tidy R package of, you know, here's a data set that is just really bad. And, um, you know, in the book, we walk through how to fix it, but it's just there for you to kind of mess with. I like that. Yeah, I, I, I thought that it really brought like all of the concepts together. And then also like the exercises that we'll be looking at now, um, feel, I feel like it's like a great intro as to like what <laughs> things you should look for. Um, yeah. So, okay. So Hadley says, you know, in this case study, I said values drop and a equal true. We got just got rid of all of them just to make it easier, right? To check that we have the correct values. So he says, is this reasonable, right? So the thing he, we have to do is think about how missing values are represented in this data set, right? Are they implicit missing values? And what is the difference between an NA and a zero, right? And so essentially reasonable, reasonableness depends on whether a missing value is means, right, that one, there were no cases of TB, or whether the missing value means that the who does not have data on the number of cases of TB, right? So what we want to do is we want to check for the presence of zeros in the data. If there are zero, if there are no zeros, then NA could mean no cases. But if there are zeros, then NAs might mean that no data is available. 
right? So let's do this uh, filter cases is equal to zero and row for that resulting. So there's actually a bunch of zeros. Um, so the cases of zero TB are explicitly stated and therefore the NAs must be missing data, data that the WHO does not have. Um, okay, a second check is whether, you know, all values for a country year combination are missing or whether only some of the values are missing. So this one took me a kind of a while to figure out, but let me see how I can walk you guys through it. So we're pivoting longer, right? The WHO, um, again, all of the variables, these strange column names will go to key, right? The values go to cases, and then we're grouping by country and year, right? Um, we're creating a new column called the proportion missing, which is just the sum of all of the NAs, in this case column, divided by this N parentheses. And I was like, what is this N parentheses thing? And so essentially this is the number of observations in the current group, which is the country and year diagnosis, sex, age range combination, right? So if you look at this, Afghanistan, right? This is the, we're in the year 1997. So all of these have cases, but if you look a little bit further, you start seeing NAs for this country year combination, right? Um, right, okay. And so there was a, a one extra step that is a filtering step. And we're essentially looking for proportions missing greater than zero and proportion missing is less than one. So if all values, right, for this year country combination are NA, then the proportion missing would have been one. You don't wanna include that, right? And zero is if none of the values are in NA. So what you're looking is for country year combinations where you have both. Um, cases explicitly stated either with numbers or zeros and NAs, right? So um, just as a, as a check, what I also did is that you should make sure that diagnosis, sex, age range combinations, that all of them are accounted for, right? So as in no combination is absent from the data set. And so I went back and sort of counted things. And so you have, let's see, it was, four types of diagnoses and then male, female, and then I think it was about seven age ranges. So you should have 56 rows for each category. And I think that that in fact is, is the case. So that, that is not missing in that way. Um, just like a sanity check. Um, but for the result of this specific you know, proportion missing, so it looks like it is possible, right, for this country year combination grouping to contain some missing values and some actual values, which we just saw, right? Um, and then finally, we wanna check for implicit missing values, right? And implicit missing values are the year country combinations that do not appear in the data, right? The, for reasons. So let's see. The, Total number of rows for who is 7240. And now this was really awesome. I was like, with this complete, right? It's gonna turn all of the implicit missing values into explicit missing, missing values. And the result, the number of rows is larger. Therefore, there are implicit missing values. So remember that complete will just take two variables and account for all of the combinations of them that in a sense would make a complete data set, right? So we know that there are implicit missing values and now we wanna figure out what these implicit missing values are. So what we're gonna do is use this anti-join and this is from the next chapter on relational data. And anti-join essentially returns the rows of the first table where it cannot find a match in the second table, right? So here we're just comparing the complete. So after the complete function, who data set versus just the who data set as is. Um, so, right, anti-join complete who, right? Versus this other who, we're looking by country and year and then we're selecting country and year. We're grouping by country. And then just to make a better sense of the years, summarizing. So the min year is the minimum of the column year for that grouping and the max is the max. Okay. 
And just remember that the range of years here are the years that are not present for that country in the WHO data set. Because I, I got confused there and I was like, why are they making these conclusions? So these are the countries, right? And these are the years. And essentially um, all of these refer to a country year combination for the years prior to the existence of that country, right? So for example, this Timor-Leste or Leste achieved independence in 2002. So the years prior to that are not included. So I was like, this, this is a fantastic way of summarizing and, you know, in a sense, looking at the data and seeing, checking for completeness. Um, okay, so a summary for this exercise is that zero in this data set is used to represent no cases of TB. The explicit missing values are used to represent missing data for the country year combinations in which the country existed in that year. So only countries that existed in that year. And then implicit missing values are used to represent missing data because a country, in a sense, did not exist in that year. Um, okay, hopefully that makes sense. Any questions? I just, I, I agree. I really liked that, like, you know, he brought it home. Like, th this exercise really, like, takes it all through and you're, it's like, oh, this makes sense. Um, yeah. There are two types of NAs and they have different meanings um and then you know like zero you know he shows the relationship because there's there are you know in data you can have lots of things that mean somewhere in yes. between something like nothing like yes. zero means there's really nothing the explicit na is here you know are like we don't know and then the implicit nas are this value doesn't make any sense like we you can't have a value here. And I just like yes. that he kind of went into some of the multiple ways that you can have a missing thing. Yeah, yeah. I guess the, the, the one thing that I wish that he would have put code in for was to make sure that all of those combinations of like diagnosis and then sex and, you know, the age ranges um, were accounted for in the data set. Because you could, you know, potentially have one missing just you know, because it wasn't entered or something, you know. So just to check for completeness in that way. Um, yeah. Um, one and I don't know. One thing that I we, it also didn't go into is like there are explicit NAs in the original data because of the column format. Mm, like mm -hmm. so, right, right. like you can't right. not you know if the column exists, then there's an NA in it for everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. For for every country and year combination that actually exists, um, but it was you know he went through right. and showed that the ones that aren't there at all, the basically the missing rows in the original data set are the implicit missing values. Um, yes. Yes. So. Yeah, yeah. Maybe it, it's not worth <laughs> getting into so many details, especially when you're looking yeah. at this type of an example. So, okay. So then. Um, uh, Hadley says, you know, I claim that ISO 2 and ISO 3 were redundant with country, right? So we need to confirm that this claim is true and think about, you know, situations where we want to might, we, we might want to keep this information in the data frame, right? So if ISO 2 and ISO 3 are redundant with country, then within each country, there should only be one distinct combination of ISO 2, ISO 3 values. So let's see what we're doing here. Selecting from who three, these three variables, um, and then we're this using distinct, and this essentially removes any duplicate rows, grouping by country, and then filtering for for that grouping anything that is greater than one. Right? Remember that n is the number of observations in the current group, and so this is returning zero, which makes sense. Um, There's nothing greater than one. Yeah. No. So extra combinations yeah one thing here is you can actually get rid of the select and just do distinct there because oh, if you give okay. if you give arguments to distinct it'll look at mm -hmm. those columns so if you say find distinct values in who three within country iso 2 and iso 3 so you would need to include the arguments from select in your first thing but just put those into distinct and yeah, yeah oh, look and, and put a close parenthesis. 
Sorry. And unless I am having yeah, a, uh, a brain right. fart here, then it should work exactly the same. Yes. Yeah. It does. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. That's actually very useful to know. And yeah, it can be useful to put a distinct in a chain where you're like, um, you know, at this point, I only care about um, distinct country and year. If there's an, a duplicate, I don't want that duplicate, things like that. Um, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. And then this, I think this is our final exercise for each country. Let me scroll up. Year and six compute the total number of cases of TB. And then we should make an informative visualization of the data. So this is what we want. So this is all the countries split by sex and then showing cases of TB by year. So this is a very, very busy um, <laughs> plot. And I just, uh, let me run this little chunk of code. So this is without the plotting, just to see what the table looks like. And so my question is, we are smushing these two. So country sex into country sex. This is just to make it easier for the call and GG plot. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I think so. I would need to see. GG plot, right? The aesthetics. Yeah. Is on the year, and then you want to group by this new country six, because otherwise, if if you had it as two separate variables, can you pass two groupings or no? I don't. I don't think so. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Right. So yeah, that's why you're combining is that is the group. You're you're Great. creating a variable that is the group. Yeah. Which can be helpful even conceptually, even if it were possible to work with it. Just, you know, you might want to have a variable that says that piece of information that you're trying to keep track of. That yeah. you want to keep track of the group. So yeah. That makes sense. Okay. And then he we can just end this with a, a little bit on non- tidy data, right? So Hadley says, you know, early in their chapter, non-tidy data was called messy, and that's sort of a pejorative term, right? And also an oversimplification, because he says, you know, obviously there are lots of useful and well-founded data structures that are not tidy data. And um, the two main reasons to use other types of data structures is that um, alternative representations may have substantial performance or space advantages. And also, you know, like specialized fields have evolved their own conventions for storing data. And that may be different from conventions for tidy data. Um, so either of these reasons means that we'll need something other than a tibble or a data frame, right? Um, if your data doesn't fit naturally into a rectangular structure composed of, you know, observations and variables, um, he thinks that tidy data should be your default choice, um, but that there are other good, you know, reasons to use other tidy data structures. Um, so I thought that that was nice in, in closing the chapter. If you want to learn more, then you can just go to this link. Um, okay, I think that that is it for this lesson. I'm glad that it wasn't as, you know, down to the detail as last time. So thank you for putting up with that last session. Um, I really, I really like explicitly going through the exercises. I think um, when it makes sense to do so, uh, mm -hmm. when you're able to do so, when you're doing one of these presentations, the exercises are more important than the rest of the chapter, really, if I yeah. feel like. So yeah. um, as far as what we go over together. Uh, so that was really good. Awesome. Um, I really, um, it, it took actually quite a bit of time to go through this, but I feel like I have a much better grasp of, you know, like what we're dealing with, with this uh, tidy data. I, I love this chapter. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's like really, like he really let you, you um, know, get your hands on real data. Like mm -hmm. this is what it's really like. Um, and so it, it's, yeah, it's a good chapter. I, I agree. Yeah. I feel like, you know, this who data set, even though it was ultra messy, it wasn't as difficult because when I first yeah. saw it, I was like, oh my gosh, it's going to take so many, steps, you know, but there are very clever ways into as to, you know, how to, how to tackle it that I think were presented really well. Yeah, there are definitely, you know, um, he had the quote at the beginning about uh, 
uh, untidy data is untidy yes. in its own, you know, each untidy data set is untidy in its own way. And there are, there are like kind of, you know, big categories of how you're untidy. Like this was systematically untidy. There were rules for what the columns were. Like it made sense mm -hmm. versus mm -hmm. other cases, you'll get real data and it's like, you know, you can't tell why something is missing. Is it missing? Is it NA because they don't know or because they, um, because it's zero, yeah. for example, yeah. like, and it's hard to yeah. tell sometimes here, you could explicitly tell, you know, like, let's say there had been like one zero in the entire mm -hmm. data set. Mm -hmm. In that case, you'd have to think, uh, okay, some of the NAs probably mean zero then, right. you know? Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So, um, which I guess takes it to, well, we don't know what the NAs mean. So yeah. Um, yeah, but yeah, exactly. so it was like, it was nicely systematically untidy. Um, yes, yes. Which, I don't know, a lot of times working with people, you can get people to be systematically untidy a lot more easily than you can get them to be tidy. <laughs> like, sometimes you can say, hey, um, you know, can you, can you always use uh, a four-digit year? Oh, okay, yeah, I can do that. And mm -hmm. can you maybe not make year the name of the column when you really mean it to be a, a row oh no i can't do that it's like okay right <laughs> right 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 yeah 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 <laughs> this is true I, and then it also sort of made me think as to you know why the who data set was organized in that way to begin with so let me see um right like why they had Oh, right. I see. Okay. So each row here is a year and then all of the types of cases. It, it, I'm assuming this was good for data entry maybe, or yeah. It could be good for data entry. It is also fairly good for being explicit about the NAs that mm -hmm. you kind of, you can't be missing an NA. Like the NAs are, are blank spaces in the, the table basically. Um, so, yeah. so that it, it, like, you know, he talks about that sometimes yeah. it's better just for storage reasons, t untidy can be better. And I think in this case, it kind of makes sense that the, all the, all the columns are there. Mm -hmm. um, it's also just sometimes this sort of thing is more natural for mm -hmm. people. And so for whatever reason, you know, like they might not explicitly have a reason it's just, well, this makes sense. You know, you want one row per country and year. That's just how we've always done it, you know? Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Like, honestly, that would make more sense to me because I feel like you're getting a sense of, you know, the countries, the years, and then whatever else you have on, on these variables, as opposed to in the long form, right? Which yeah. you is not as easy to get a sense of what countries and years are covered. Right. So, yeah. And it's, it's really hard to see what is missing in the long form. So I can, you know, when you're doing yes. data entry, yeah, something fairly wide often makes sense. Like, yeah. um, you know, you might have a patient, uh, just one row per patient, for example, and then a column for each, uh, each time they show up and we take yeah. their weight and we take their, um, you know, uh, heart rate, and we take all these things, you might have a different column for each visit for each yes. of those things, which Absolutely, you know, yeah. should be a row at most per like patient and visit. Um, but yeah, it just, sometimes it just makes more sense that way. Uh, mm. Like, you know, I work with student data and like mm -hmm. a typical grade book has a row per student and then a column per assignment. But all yeah. of those columns are grades. So in some cases, what I would really want is a row per student and assignment and then a column per grade or a column that's just all their grades, you know? So yeah. it's just yeah, some, yeah, yeah. sometimes untidy makes sense. Um. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, I, I think that, um, I guess the more I see this and the more I practice, it, it'll just give me a, a better like intuitive sense for uh, and yet, um, it's gonna work best, yeah. In the chat, uh, mm -hmm. Kuntai, I'm just not sharing. 
Yeah, I'm not certain yeah. how to pronounce your name. I think it's Kuntai. Uh, points out that sometimes it's if you're doing derived variables, like, mm -hmm. you know, if you want the, uh, I don't know, like some sort of, there are two years, and so they have two columns, and then you want a third column that's like the ratio of those two years or something like that. That can be easier to see in, in the um, wider format. Yes, so, yes. Um, yeah, there definitely are cases where it makes sense. I'm trying to remember. I mean, you know, pivot wider does exist. Like there is, there are times when you want it wider. Yeah, um, for sure. Okay, I'm just, I'm just checking out the chat now. Sensitive, yeah, that makes sense. Um, okay, so that yeah. is census data is organized in the in the white IC. Yeah. yeah. No, honestly, like, um, you know, like I I work with. Um, I guess not patient data, but it's more like uh, in my own studies, it's more like patient per visit and then all sorts of, you know, different measures for that one. Right. Whatever patient. Yeah. So. So, yeah, I shared a package um, called YDR. It's like a, a <laughs> relative for TIDR and it's specifically aimed at cases where wide data makes sense and it mm -hmm. shows some reasons where wide can make sense. So, um, yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm also seeing the link to writing. Okay. Let me just copy this before we go. Okay, so that's all that I have for, for this chapter. Um, thank you for listening and sitting through it. I, all right. I feel like I learned a lot. Yeah, it was great. Um, and then, so next week, uh, Federica, right? That's who volunteered. All right. Uh, thank you very much. And I'll see you all next week. Bye.